Welcome everyone. Pleased to have you with us here today for uh, This is CDR. Um, this is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air to contextualize carbon removal um, for policy. Um, we're working on a number of different kinds of CDR policy proposals uh, at multiple jurisdictions, levels of government in the US, as well as in a number of uh, other countries. So um, it's really about showing people what CDR is and the range of uh, different solutions that are being developed. Everyone, please, uh, as Mega said in the chat, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're zooming in from. Um, Toby Bryce, based in Brooklyn, New York, where we are now officially in sweater weather. Um, also, today is our 50th episode of uh, This is CDR. Um, bit of a milestone. We started the program last August um, and have had 50 great or 49 great episodes and our 50th will be today. Just wanted to thank all of you for attending. Uh, many of you attend regularly. Also to the open air team members who've really helped um, behind the scenes, um, Chris and Mega um, uh, in front of the scenes. Uh, and of course, all of the great presenters who we've had, entrepreneurs, researchers, policy folks, <clears throat> environmental justice leaders. Um, so i um, very pleased uh, to be here today for our 50th episode. Quick background on open air. Sorry, Open Air is a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Uh, we're a global community. We work together on shared open source missions in the areas of policy advocacy, R&D, um, and activist CDR market development. Um, there should be some links in the chat to uh, to uh, sign up and join our group. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter if you want to keep track of what we're working on um, and would love to have you be a part of what we're doing. Um, the join link is just a simple form, and then that gets you onto our Discord server, which is like Slack, and that's what we use to communicate and kind of organize our projects and everything else. Before we get started with the program, we always like to give a quick background on carbon removal, just to make sure we're speaking the same language and we're all talking about the same thing. Um, here's a definition of carbon removal from a, a great resource called the CDR Primer, and we'll put a link for, to that in the chat. It's also essentially the same definition that the IPCC uses. Um, carbon removal is an anthropogenic purposeful human activity to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and to durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. Two really important things uh, to note when we talk about CDR. Number one, um, CDR is not what is typically called carbon capture, which is capturing CO2 from an emission source, whether it's a natural gas power plant or a cement plant. Um, that may or may not be a good climate solution, depending on the situation. But what one thing it's not is carbon removal. Um, that's you know that's carbon capture is a form of emissions reduction, and carbon removal is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So two different things. Number two, it's really important to call out up front. Everyone in the CDR sector, I think, is very cognizant of this, but um, it's important to do regardless. Um, CDR is in no way, shape, or form a, a substitution for reducing emissions as quickly and as completely as possible. Um, we have to decarbonize our economy, um, reduce as many emissions as we can as quickly as we can. That said, um, there are going to be certain emissions, um, for example, in the agricultural and food sectors that are going to be hard to abate. There are going to be other emissions that are inequitable to abate. It's not the fair to hold India or a country in the global south to the same standard as U.S. and Europe. So we are going to need carbon removal. Um, there's clear scientific consensus that gigaton scale carbon removal will be required by mid-century for us to have any um, chance of limiting warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. And we are, you know, effectively, we have a lot of great research happening, but we're effectively nowhere in scale today. So we really need to start deploying now so we have a chance to get to gigaton scale by mid-century. Um, going to hand it over now to my colleague, Mega, who is going to talk about a little bit about run of show and introduce today's uh, amazing presenters. Hey everyone, I am Mega. I'm an open air member uh, based in London and working on policy advocacy opportunities um, over here and in California where I'm from. Um, so quick housekeeping note, our format will be a quick presentation um, from our presenters followed by a couple of prepared questions and then moderated audience Q&A. So if you have any questions along the way, please just type them in the Q&A box as we go along. Um, it's separate from the chat box, so please use one labeled Q&A if you can, uh, just to help us organize the questions a bit easier. Um, and the event is being recorded, so we'll send the video link out to everyone who registered, and we'll also post it to Open Air's website and our YouTube channel. 
Uh, all right. This week on This is CDR, very pleased to welcome Lithos Carbon co-founders Mary Yap and Dr. Noah Planowski to tell us about how the company accelerates mineral weathering by spreading basalt on croplands and uses novel soil models and machine learning to maximize CO2 removal while boosting crop growth. Mary Yap is the co-founder and CEO at Lithos, a leading company transforming farmland into carbon capture centers. The team's mission is to accelerate mineral weathering, an integral process in the Earth's carbon cycle that naturally captures CO2 at the gigaton scale. Lithosis technology incorporates cutting edge research from Yale and Georgia Tech and uses novel soil models and machine learning to maximize permanent CO2 removal while boosting crop growth. Lithos is one of five startups from around the globe selected as inaugural suppliers for the Frontier Climate Fund's first round of permanent carbon, uh, carbon credit purchases and is backed by investors including Union Square Ventures, Greylock Partners, and Bain Capital Ventures. Mary previously studied plant biology at the University of Chicago and geology and planetary sciences at Yale University. Uh, where she conducted award-winning scientific and urban research on the climate crisis. Mary previously spent six and uh, over six years uh, scaling early stage startups to millions of users across 55 countries, and her family are generational smallholder vegetable farmers in Taiwan. Noah Planovsky is a co-founder at Lithos and an associate professor with the Department of Earth and Plan Planetary Sciences at Yale University. He's the director of the Yale Metal Geochemistry Center and is on the steering committee for the Yale Center for Na Natural Ca Carbon Capture. As an isotope geochemist, he leverages field studies, analytical chemistry, novel isotope systems, and geochemical modeling to uncover the story of environmental change in Earth's past, present, and future. He has extensively published on atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, and but currently focuses on deploying carbon capture through enhanced rock weathering in marine and terrestrial systems, and tracking how primary productivity has changed through time. Noah has published over 150 papers in high impact journals and has over 15,000 citations and is a recipient of the Clark Medal and the Packard Fellowship, among other awards. Uh, along with their co-founder, Chris Reinhardt, Noah co-invented Lithos' novel isotope dilution technology to enable cost-effective and precise empirical verification of carbon dioxide removal in soil. Originally from Wisconsin, Noah still co-runs the family farm in the Midwest today. Um, so to our presenters, whenever you're ready uh, to come on video, um, over to you. Hi, everyone. It's great to, to be here with you guys. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you guys see that? Is that working? Yep, I that looks so. good. Someone know? Okay, great. Well, hi, folks. We're Lithos, and we're really excited to share our carbon removal technology here with you today. Chris, Noah, um, Chris and Noah have been working on this research for over a decade at Yale and at Georgia Tech in their previous atmospheric science studies. And this year, we're really hitting the ground running and scaling up across farmlands across America. Um, we're working at kiloton capture levels today, and we're really excited to share what we are learning and building with you all. Overall, our mission is to build one of the most scalable and cost-effective forms of carbon removal and to deploy enhanced weathering at scale. For a high level sense of things, for those who are unfamiliar, enhanced rock weathering is based on a process in nature called natural rock weathering. It's actually responsible for the earth being habitable today. How that works in a nutshell is that when CO2 is circulating around the globe, um, it combines with rainwater in the clouds and creates something called acid rain. We've all kind of heard of acid rain. Usually we talk about that in the sense of acid rain that's caused by you know fuel, exhaust, pollutants, et cetera. But there's also a natural form of this. And when that comes down out of the clouds, hits exposed rock surfaces across the world, that leads to silicate weathering, which converts the CO2 in the rain into a bicarbonate HCO3, which is now locked up, pretty irreversible. That goes off into groundwaters and rivers, goes off into the ocean, kind of like, you know, what you see in this picture, and eventually falls down to the bottom, is sequestered for 10,000 to 100,000 years. This process has already been happening for four and a half billion years on Earth. And this is one of the only key reasons that Earth is doesn't look like Venus today with greenhouse gases everywhere. So what we do at Lithos is we take this natural process and speed it up by an order of magnitude. So what we do is we work specifically with basalt, which is this dark black volcanic rock that you see here on the screen. It's what you see in Hawaii or in Iceland. We move it to agricultural and arable fields where it improves crop yields and substitutes for ex existing expensive agricultural inputs. Um, in the fields, it can improve crop yields pretty significantly. Um, and uh, in general, this sounds very, very simple in practice. However, it's actually a lot more complex than that. So we're gonna get into that today. 
On the left, you see a live drone photo that we've taken of the waste basalt finds from one of our quarries that we work with today. There's a lot of the stuff and something key is we're not crushing it up. We're not grinding it. This is actually a non-saleable, um, non-commercial waste byproduct that comes out of the process of mining for aggregates or for things for roofing tiles, et cetera. We move that to fields. However, as you actually get to scale, as you deploy this outside of just the laboratory university setting, there are a lot of challenges that you start to um, encounter. One of them is that this is not a uniform process. Carbon removal, the speed at which it happens, and the crop benefits that you are generating for farmers are not uniform depending on the setting and the kind of rock you're using. A fun little detail is if you were to zoom in on the dust particles in this rock pile over here, um, they're really not the same. And every single quarry we work with has different particle size distributions, different chemical mineralogies, different potential to capture carbon, which we'll get into a little bit later. Second, measurement and MRV is a major challenge, which Noah will delve into. So overall, our approach at Lithos is we try to simplify this for farmers and build something farmers really want. We do everything from sourcing the waste dust, testing it in our labs, making sure it's safe, making sure there's no heavy metals, making sure that this is good for carbon removal and also for pH buffering. We transport this to the fields, we handle all of that for farmers, and then we measure it at the end of the day. Um, overall, we work on a process that hopefully permanently removes the carbon, measures that really well, and also has a lot of benefits for the farmers. So, as I mentioned, MRV is a huge, really important challenge that uh, we have to tackle as the field grows, and Noah's going to dive into this now. Great. Um, yeah, so going to try to give you very briefly an overview of our, our MRV technique, our monitoring, recording, and verification technique, which is a little bit different than other um, efforts you may have heard about in, uh, in following enhanced rock weathering. So our process, like everybody, has to start in the field scale has to start with where you actually have what is probably the highest uncertainty technique, which is um, which Sorry. is the extent of basalt weathering that actually occurs. After that, however, we actually follow the products of the weathering um, in a modeling framework into surface waters and then follow those into the ocean to be able to say how much of the carbon that we actually move in the field scale is removed over a given time frame in the oceans, right? So enhanced weathering in general transfers carbon from the atmosphere into a dissolved product that flows through rivers and is stored in the oceans. We try to track what happens through that whole process. So a, a cradle to grave perspective on this process. So starting out in the soils, um, we're taking a different approach than how many people are trying to track this. What a lot of groups trying to understand the extent of weathering, the extent of, of carbon dioxide removal that's occurring in the field scale are trying to look at waters that are leaving fields or waters that you pull from soils. Um, what we're doing instead is trying to focus on the amount of basalt that is left over in the soil after a given time frame. Um, taking a soil-based approach that provides an integrated look instead of a water-based approach that provides a snapshot at any moment where you look at water chemistry. Um, so the basic idea from this is pretty straightforward, um, or hopefully will come across as relatively straightforward. Um, so soils have a very different chemical composition than the basalt that we're adding to them. So you can think of it basically as a two component mixing model where you move between soil and basalt as depending on the amount that you add from that. Um, and you can think about this mixing between an element that is involved in the carbon dioxide removal, for instance, magnesium, and an element that is immobile, that just stays in the soil. So when you place it in that framework, as we have carbon dioxide removal occurring, as we have weathering occurring, you deviate from this simple mixing relationship in a sample that you would measure in your field. And that deviation from this line is the extent of initial carbon dioxide removal, of initial basalt weathering that has occurred. So that seems very simple, uh, or hopefully that seems very simple. The problem with this is you're actually adding a very small amount of basalt to the soil. So what that means is with typical analytical techniques, it's not actually possible to resolve these signals. Um, so what we've done over the last couple of years um, is come up with a way to basically have a much more precise and accurate measurement of the, of the amount of 
weathering that has occurred, how much of these mobile elements that are involved in carbon dioxide removal that have been lost from the system. And for those of you that are really into uh, mass spectrometry, in case there are any on this, on this uh, webinar, we're doing this with isotope dilution mass spectrometry. So um, for, for a, a really fun, uh, or a, what I think is a fun acronym and name, we're using isotope dilution magnetic sector inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, <laughs> uh, which just gives you a way to accurately quantify the amount of cations that are the amount of, of um, mobile elements that are lost from the soil because of weathering. Um, we've done this now in a wide range of settings, both on, on projects that we've started and working with um, collaborators on test, test, pilots, test plots that they've started. We find you can actually have a huge range depending on how you handle the material, um, the size of the material, the chemistry of the material and the actual um, crops that are grown, a huge range of different extents of weathering in any one setting, um, right? From something where the maximum potential of weathering in the product that you applied occurs over a several year time period to something where even after several years, you have limited extents of weathering in, weathering in your system. What I think this really just shows us is that we need to have a solid, this is a great way of demonstrating that we need to have a solid framework of understanding how we can actually make this process work and make sure we're not spending money and time and releasing carbon through moving material around in a way that's not actually going to capture carbon. Um, the next step, as I said, this, it's, it's important for us is we don't only track this in the field scale. We wanna actually figure out how this moves through surface waters and what, how long this is stored in the oceans. So we're doing this by having a dynamic river network. So when you have weathering occurring, those weathering products will actually move into surface waters in a combined river network. So this um, orange map here may not look very, um, may look like just a, a poor degree of shading, but what it is is actually river segments in the United States. So if you, an easier way of looking at this potentially, Mary, if you go to the next slide, would be removing the smallest rivers, um, which in many cases you can think of more as streams from this, from that system and focusing just on a single river network. So this is of course the Mississippi River Network. Um, and the blue dot here is where I'm from. So when we have a trial in our, when we have a deployment in our fields in Wisconsin, what happens is the weathering products that we've empirically measured will move into this river network and it will flow down into the Gulf of Mexico. But the, but the actual um, chemistry and how the um, how the the chemistry of the rivers is constrained is controlled by all of the rivers in this network. Um, what we've actually done is we've used millions of individual um, data points for rivers, the chemistry of individual rivers, to train a model. It's with a machine learning framework, and that allows us to, in any one river segment in this framework, predict the river chemistry and predict how carbon fluxes from that segment of a river will change as we modify that by putting in the products of enhanced weathering. And lastly, as I've said, we don't only need to know what happens to the carbon that we've removed through enhanced weathering in, in rivers. We need to also figure out how much of that carbon is actually stored in rivers. We're doing that by using a earth system model called CGNI. Um, and what we can do is take the products of the weathering in a given point from a river discharge, place them into an ocean um, model that has again, dynamic chemistry. And that will allow us over a hundred years or a thousand years, or whatever folks would like to consider as permanent determine the amount of carbon that is actually stored in the oceans instead of being re-released to the atmosphere. Um, so that starting from a measurement in fields, moving through rivers, and then quantifying what happens in the ocean is our monitoring, reporting, and verification framework.
Fantastic. So as Noah mentioned, getting MRV right is essential. Um, that's a really, really critical part that we've spent years and years and lots of research time and energy, um, you know, really nailing down both on the field level, how much carbon is being captured initially, and then the leakage and all the downstream effects that Noah just mentioned um, as it's transported to the oceans. But just as essential as the MRV and measuring this so that we can continue learning as a field is actually how we get to scale. So backing up a little bit here, um, I think it's really, really important to talk about how do you get this to scale commercially, not just from, uh, you know, the scientific aspect of, you know, this is great, this works, like this can be measured, but also how do you actually get real farmers, real arable lands worldwide to sign up for this and actually want to do that and do it quickly, not two decades from now, but actually like tomorrow, today. Um, and so our approach is the following. We actually kind of think of it kind of like the Tesla model. I would argue that Elon Musk didn't build an electric car. He focused on building a car that was really awesome, has wonky doors, goes really fast, it's really fun if you drive it, and it looks really cool. He focused on building something that people would want, would love, and really need, and then he solves climate change as a side effect, right? Like, that's kind of the approach that we're also trying to take with farmers. So from our perspective, we're trying to build something that farmers will want, need, and love, even if the carbon effects were not there, and then as long as they are adopting this, this will continue to scale. You capture carbon, you remove carbon as a side effect. And so one of our key parts of our tech stack that allows us to do this part of it, like we work with farmers at scale and very rapidly, is our software that we've built in-house um, over, again, many years of research work. And we call it Scepter. I'm not even going to do the NOAA thing and read out the whole thing. It's, it's very much a tongue twister for me. <laughs> but it's called Scepter. And Scepter does a few different things for us. First and foremost, it allows us to predict the application rates on a field by field basis. And I wanna zoom in on this a little bit. What we found is that every single field deployment is very, very unique. Not only is the basalt that you see here unique from quarry to quarry or even parts of a stockpile, more importantly, fields are unique. So even though climatological factors such as rainfall and ground temperature, et cetera, are really important in determining generally the ceiling, for weathering rates and capture rates. Something we've actually found is that when you've got two fields right next to each other from the same farmer, or even just two farmers that are like five miles down the road from each other, same climatological area, they actually will have different carbon capture rates because there's a lot of nonlinear parameters in their soil that actually influence the actual speed of the basalt weathering and thus carbon capture and also pH benefits. The so sector helps us control for that. So what Sucre does in a nutshell, and we can get into this in the Q&A, is that it handles a lot of different inputs, including all these different variables we're able to get from farmer soil data, as well as climatology, which everyone already thinks about. And then it allows us to get out a few different outputs that we use to customize a recipe on a field by field basis for the farmers. And in a nutshell, what we do is we are precisely engineering the agricultural land to capture carbon as quickly as possible, not over decades, but actually, again, as quickly as possible. Second, and more importantly for the farmers, which is what I spend most of my time on, we are actually working on making sure that we're maximizing the crop benefits, the crop growth, the pH benefits, um, those kinds of things. For the farmers as well. And so Scepter generates these recommendations and predicts capture rates for us as well prior to deployments. So as we mentioned, soil is incredibly diverse and oftentimes two fields right next to each other, completely different soils because their families have gone over, you know, 200 different years of management practices, growing different crops, different fertilizers, etc. Um, so a critical point to drive home is that our in-house software also works on producing reliable results and a diverse array of soil settings. So different kinds of soil organic matter settings, um, different kinds of soil that we um, interact with all the time. We actually work on understanding precisely how the CO2 removal and the pH buffering will work in these very different settings and also come up with a precise recommendation that actually works in diverse settings and simpl simplifies things for growers. Um, in addition to substituting for limestone, which I'm sure we're going to get into in the Q&A, uh, we also do other things for the farmers as well. So not only are we replacing the expensive agricultural input limestone that farmers use almost every year, we're also working on introducing additional micronutrients and macronutrients to the soil. Going to keep this very lightweight, but in short, as basalt dissolves in the field, it releases a vast array of micronutrients and macronutrients, including iron, potassium, um, phosphorus, 
silicon and the like. And this is actually really important for farmers and it has been especially important this year. What we see is that in the market, farmers are always subject to very volatile price fluctuations for the inputs that they have to buy. This is a real chart from, um, you know, this year, potash prices were three to four times higher. Um, and a lot of the farmers we actually work with couldn't afford it or couldn't afford it at the rates they needed this year. On the right, we've modeled out um, how much basalt, uh, potassium and phosphorus we're actually adding to the soil at some common application rates for us. And what we found is that um, as the stuff gets released into the soil, this actually can help reduce the amount of fertilizer in P and K specifically that farmers are gonna need and thus ease that burden for them and lower their need for traditional fertilizer. So in a nutshell, gonna move on to the Q&A, but what we are working on is we start with two key questions. One, how do we rigorously improve the speed of carbon removal as Noah mentioned and the accuracy of measurement at scale from a cradle to grave approach? And second, we always start with why do farmers want this? This year, we're in track to capture a couple thousand tons of carbon across acres in America. And we're working on solving key components for transforming cropland into carbon capture centers, improving crop yields for farmers, regenerating the nutrients in their land, helping them with some drought and pest resistance, which we didn't have time to get into, helping them earn carbon removal credits. So actually bringing in capital from the coast and bringing this to rural farmers who are often seeing their bottom line suffer from climate change or from these volatile price fluctuations and in inputs. And again, replacing existing rock dust that they use today. So by meeting farmers where their needs are, we think we can draw down more carbon and help transform the space of agriculture which is responsible for a massive amount of emissions worldwide, but also provides one of the most promising new fields for carbon removal. Thanks so much. All right. I think Toby, you might be muted. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much. That was fantastic and um, very exciting to learn more about what you guys are doing. Um, we always start with a few prepared questions that we kind of crowdsource from our open air community. And then um, we see a couple already in the Q&A box, but uh, live attendees, please uh, add your questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> I always like to start out a little bit, maybe on a more personal note and have would love to hear from you both. Um, sort of your personal journey to carbon removal and rock dust and enhanced rock weathering? Like, how did you get to where you are? How did you meet? How did uh, lithos form um, in either order you guys want to go? But we'd love to hear from both of you on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so most of my most of my research was actually on on Earth's history, thinking about the carbon cycle on, on much longer timescales. Um, that was where my PhD work was on and where my lab's initial research was on. Um, but always had a strong interest in agriculture for um, for many reasons. And it just became increasingly clear to me as, as things went on that carbon dioxide removal was not something that um, was not something that was optional, but it was absolutely essential for us to, to meet climate goals. So um, I think that is where a lot of people came to to carbon dioxide removal, just the the, the 1.5 degree report was obviously essential in shaping a lot of people's view and public opinions. Um, but um, yeah, and for, for me, it was actually, it was a fun one where I, I um, a lot of the code that I used to understand Earth's early history and actually some of the the code that we used to, to study exoplanets actually um, is, is applicable to what we're doing here as well. So um, it's in, in many ways what I was, whether I was studying uh, the Earth's early history or thinking about an exoplanet, really it's thinking about how planets work, how the carbon cycle works. So um, it seems like a big jump to, 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 to move from thinking about how the Earth evolved to, to thinking about carbon dioxide removal. But the basic toolkit and the, the basic tools we have are, um, we're, we're exactly the same. Awesome. And my journey has been a little bit different. Um, it's been pretty non-traditional. So 
I actually, when I was 18, I left college to start an early consumer software company out here in Silicon Valley, taught myself the code, taught myself how to build things for users at the million user scale. Um, and that was really fun. But after a six year career in product management and strategy and biz dev, I um, realized that there were bigger problems that I wanted to work on. I went through a few personal tragedies in 2016 and just made me realize life is really short, you know? Um, and survival is not guaranteed for us as individuals or as a society. And if, you know, we don't know how much time we've got on this planet, we should be working on the most important problems at any time. So I took a step back. I actually went back, got my degree at Yale, studied geology and planetary sciences, did a lot of carbon and hydrology modeling um, and research there. Met Noah in like climate change classes, geochemistry classes, and I think oceanography. I'm a big marine biology nerd. And likewise, so is Noah. And so we just got to talking. So it was really inspiring to kind of see the research that they had been working on um, and to start thinking about how we could scale this up and make a really big dent on the climate crisis now, not just in a decade, which was kind of, I was like, research, like, let's figure out how to make a dent. But I was like, wait, this can, this is ready to go. So yeah, that's how Lithos was born. That's great. Um, great answers. Um, I mean, a bit of a wonky question. Um, and you, you talked a little bit about one of the challenges of enhanced rock weathering or carbon removal via enhanced rock weathering more generally is heterogeneity of feedstock. Um, we had your friends from Carbon Drawdown Initiative, uh, Dirk and Ingrid, um, on a month or so ago. And one of the things I was just struck by one of the things they've learned through their field trials in Europe is that intuitively you would think the smaller the particle, the more effective, but that's not quite true. Can like, just as an example of like the heterogeneity question, can you talk about how particle size, it's not that simple? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can take a I can take a first go. That I think one of the things All that's right. that's um, uh, essential for for that is that it's um, the react the reactivity of the the reactivity of the the individual grain doesn't necessarily scale with with the um, the actual particle size. And the biggest actually the biggest aspect of determining how this rate or how efficient enhanced weathering is that we found is actually whether or not you're forming secondary products. Um, so if you're forming secondary products on any of your grains, that immediately, um, you know, shuts down the process, basically, um, that really stifles the process. So I think one of the reasons we put so much time into our, um, our model that is, is, also, is, a, is a tool for MRV, but also gives you ideal uh, application scenarios, is to, is to make sure that we can, can predict when you can have reactions proceeding efficiently without the the secondary mineral phase is slowing slowing those down. And what's an example of a secondary mineral phase that would be um, deleterious to the process? Yeah, um, clays uh, will commonly form on the surface of your grains. Um, thanks for thanks for clarifying on that. Um, and there's there's a whole bunch of whole bunch of clays um, that have have fun names, but uh, most of them because we're weathering basalt are going to be things that contain iron and magnesium in them that can actually form directly on article grains. So you're, you're trying to push the reaction as quickly as possible to get a decent amount of carbon dioxide removal in the unit of land that you have. But if you push it too hard, you can actually form extensive, um, extensive clays and actually have very slow overall rates, despite, um, you know, maybe a high application rate. Interesting. Anything you want to add, Mary, or I have more questions? No, I think that covers a lot of it. I mean, the other thing um, that we can dive into and we can also geek out a lot about is also specific surface area. So one of like the heterogeneities that we see in the feedstock is actually surface area. So depending on the kind of equipment that this particular quarry um, uses and the dust is generated through that process. Um, imagine like zooming in with an electron microscope on a dust particle, right? Um, sometimes you might see that's like very smooth, like a tennis ball. And sometimes you might see it's very spiky, like, you know, a Christmas tree star or something like that. And that obviously creates an order of magnitude difference in the amount of surface area and the amount of initial weathering that can happen right. over the first period of time. So that's another thing that influences it as well. Very cool. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you guys are, uh, I put the link in the chat to your, your really, I read it last night, it's really interesting, your Frontier proposal um, and very detailed. Uh, you guys are Frontier partners. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about the, the you and I, the Frontier and Carbon Plan work that was published, I guess, two weeks ago now about verification confidence levels, which I thought was very exciting for the sector because it it offers a way for early stage methods to to 
to scale because you it gives you a way to kind of price in some of the uncertainties that we've been talking about so that you can still sell carbon credits. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, and there is a specific one that we can put in the chat for enhanced rock weathering. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on that work and how you see it impacting your, your business? For sure. Um, do you want me to start? No? Okay. I'm going to go with that. So yeah, I'm really, really excited to see the field sort of diving into all the complexities for enhanced rock weathering. Obviously it's a very different sort of um, direct or it's a very different kind of carbon removal method compared to like direct air capture, right? It's an open system. There's so many different boxes if you pull up that VCL framework um, that are important to measure and think about and sort of reduce the uncertainties for. So our perspective is the following. One, um, the more that we can deploy at scale, the more that we can do our cradle to grave approach and get additional data on the in-field measurements and um, the alkalinity changes, the leakage studies for the rivers, getting to scale will also get us the data faster that will be needed to gain more confidence in the field. So that's one thing. Second, we're really excited about the fact that this VCL framework is working to um, make very open and transparent for all these different kinds of carbon buyers who might be more nascent in the market, help them understand the different uncertainties that go into the carbon pricing, that go into how certain this carbon credit that they're buying is, and then also just getting a better understanding of how enhanced weathering will work. I think it's very important for the field to stay honest in terms of how much we are capturing so we can measure ourselves. You really make what you measure. Um, and so we're really excited to see the see Frontier and the Carbon Plan folks push that forward. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with all of that. I guess just to would add briefly, I think we should think of those very much as a as a document that, and I think this is how Frontier and Carbon Plan are also working it as a, a document that is is very much um, constantly in progress and is is going to change. Yeah. I think one of the things that's important to think about that is that's it's kind of a hard question or a hard aspect to to think about knowing how to quantify this because something has a lot of complexity doesn't mean that we can't necessarily understand that in in great detail. Um, so uh, the obvious example of that is like weather is pretty complex. We've made massive uh, massive progress in actually understanding the uncertainty of that. Um, in some cases, river networks are something that is complex, but we actually have the tools. We have a framework to understand what happens to the products of weathering in a in um, a, a, a dynamic river network. So, I think as we'll we'll have to as as research progresses and as as companies basically try to 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 roll out um, ever more hopefully ever more sophisticated types of of our ability to track these products those we should imagine that those change uh, change quite a bit yeah. Very well said, both of you. I, I think that, and I encourage everyone in the audience, if you haven't looked at it, there are a couple of links in the chat. Um, they they did VCLs for six methods. And it's just, I think it's super important for the for the sector and, and a way that we can move forward in, in, in the sort of like necessary or unavoidable uncertainty that, that something new like carbon removal faces. Um, it's kind of a related question. It's a little bit of an audible, but um, Puro, uh, uh, European-based uh, um, carbon removal marketplace registry and standard. Um, it's been on the program here. Um, they are publishing for public comment a enhanced rock weathering methodology. Um, and the public comments due October 17th, I think. And we can put that link in the chat. I think if you're interested, you should read it and comment on it. But what how do you see protocols or methodologies, different people call the different things, but how do you see that getting standardized across a uh, method like enhanced rock weathering do you envision that each individual company will have your own protocol um will there be a sector-wide protocol like how do you anticipate that happening because the protocols are you know charm released their own protocol because the existing standards bodies aren't able to process the idea of bio oil currently um you know how do you see that progressing for enhanced rock weathering for sure. Great question, Toby. Really appreciate that. So obviously, I think right now we're serving sort of the wild west of carbon removal. There's so many protocols that will be developed. We're really excited to help co contribute to all these different things. On our end, I think there's a few things that we can control. And there's the question of how we contribute to those. One, we're very, very big fans of open source publishing, the work that we do. And um, we think it's very important, again, to keep the field honest, to help push the field forward. And so one of the things we're working on is publishing everything. So there can be a comment on the stuff that we're working on as well. So that's one. Um, the second thing is that as these protocols are developed, I think it's very important for folks to think about the different approaches there, right? There can be very simulation-based approaches. There can be very empirical-based approaches. Um, I think they all have their strengths and different weaknesses. Um, and I think it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out over the next few years. I do think it's important to compare um, sort of the enhanced weathering protocols that will be coming out 
to the work that's been done for, you know, let's say soil organic carbon, which was a very different approach. You know, they don't empirically measure this very much. And that's kind of due to the economics of non-permanent removal. Um, but I think that's a question that the field is going to have to ask in coming months and years as we figure out, one, what's economically feasible, um, both now and at scale, and two, how do we keep ourselves again honest with the amount of carbon that's being captured and accounting for leakage and other uncertainties like emissions and transport, et cetera. I would, uh, to, to add to that, I think one of the things um, to, or it's the, maybe to take a step back, I think uh, there's quite a few people are doing enhanced weathering. I think everybody is, is, has the core, core, core beliefs that are actually very similar to that, but there are also important differences in what we're, what we're doing. So I think having the ability for everybody to express what they think is important. Um, I may think the river networks, having a dynamic river network is more important than other people. And, <laughs> and that's something where you should assume there's debate and conversation on that. Yeah. But I think as, as a community, actually, there is already progress to, um, to, to be very collaborative within the hands rock weathering community. So for instance, we're doing a model in a comparison project right now. Um, and that's not something that was forced upon us. That's something that as a community, we decided was very important that we wanted to do and, and drive forward as to make sure that enhanced rock weathering is advancing as rapidly as possible. Fantastic. One last question, then we're going to switch it over to get to some of these great audience questions that are coming in. Um, uh, we always like to ask uh, presenters who are actually working on commercializing carbon removal. Um, the you know we believe that the sector must really proactively address equity, environmental justice, and the potential negative externalities as they relate to the deployment of your specific method. Um, you know, you would think in the abstract that oh, enhanced rock weathering is so benign. But when um, we had a Holly Buck on the program earlier this year, and she actually uses an example like how do you think about the the dust, and how do you think about the people that are actually applying the the enhanced rock, you know, the ground up basalt to the fields? Yeah. Um, and that was something that I hadn't thought of. And so, like, what what are some of the things that you you think about and how are you planning to address them, you know, as a company and also with the agricultural communities that you um, are going to be partnering with? Yeah, great question. I mean, obviously, one of the things we're one of the main reasons that I'm doing this, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is I think this actually can help farmers. Um, so in, in the most basic level, actually, before talking about details from this, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that farmers are the main stakeholder in this, and they are people that are ever like increasingly being in fact, increasingly being affected by severe climate events. So they are people that are, um, you know, very susceptible to, to storms that can wipe out an entire crop. Um, so in some ways actually providing a more secure in, income source for them is a way to actually deal with a, a major issue of, of climate injustice. And I think tying farmers into a robust carbon market is a way to actually help farmers be more financially stable. But also with that in mind, we wanna do more good than harm have to, of course, be have to be very diligent and be very careful about making sure that you don't have negative side effects. So the two that obviously come to mind for enhanced weathering is keeping track of, of the dust um, and keeping track of the, the trace metals and the, the potentially harmful trace metals associated with those process. Um, so I think from, from uh, our point of view and from, um, I think, most people in this space point of view is that those are luckily things that we can track really easily. Um, We've monitored dust both in deployment um, and in kind of background levels associated with the deployment, meaning while someone's actually spreading when the risk would be highest, and then what are the background levels associated with that? And um, luckily, but it, this goes back to the question of what feedstock you're choosing. In the feedstocks we're working with, that's luckily something that hasn't been an issue, but that you always need to make sure you're carefully monitoring. And again, when we're selecting feedstocks, um, from a trace metal point of view, you have the choice to choose something that has essentially no risk for a, a, a long-term trace metal concern or something that you know, may have a trace metal concern. So we've, we've um, selected partners in quarries and feedstocks where we can minimize that risk as much as possible since a, a farmer's soil is, is, uh, is their most valuable asset. You don't wanna do anything that would, that would harm that. You wanna do the exact opposite. I mean, I know it's a longer conversation and that was a short answer, but that was great examples of the, some of the things that you're thinking about. And I'm really glad that you're, that you are thinking about those things and those are really good illustrations. Um, I'm going to switch it over to Mega now. Um, and she's going to start asking some of these audience questions. Um, so Mega. Okay. Um, no, we're good. Um, all right. Yeah. So we've got quite a few. Um, the first one I wanted to ask kind of goes off of what we were just talking about. Um, you know, you mentioned a lot of the benefits that 
go to farmers out of this process, but what kind of reactions have you gotten when you've actually talked to them? Are, you know, are they pretty much like straight away on board with all those benefits or are there certain points of concern and how do you address those? Yeah, I think what it gets down to is really being able to understand precisely what's going to happen in this farmer's fields, right? So the first thing that we often do is we get a copy of their most recent soil data, because most of the farmers we work with are folks who test their soils every year or so, um, get a copy of that. We plug that into our model. We're able to tell them what we think the carbon removal will look like, but more importantly to them, what the pH buffering will look like at a specific application rate. And that's really the key thing here. Um, the way that we approach it is we want to replace 100% of the limestone in any acre that we deploy for these farmers, but we also need to be able to guarantee to them that that pH buffering is going to happen. Can't happen next year. That would not work, right? It has to happen during the growing season. And so that's the key thing that SEPTR, our in-house software um, allows for. So when we're able to do that for the farmers, the farmers are actually very, very keen. A lot of them are one, generally supportive of the climate thing here. And second, most of all, really excited about the fact that this can substitute for expensive agricultural lime, right? Um, that's something that is an existing pain point for them. It can be very expensive in certain areas. Um, and so knowing that we can hit those targets for them and then also improve some crop yields above that um, is really what, what cinches the deal for them. Noah, anything to add? Yeah, and I think part of it, um, one of the things that thinking about why this can can scale and thinking about farmer acceptance is is many folks are familiar with the idea that you're putting down limestone to have to have different soil pH, but actually farmers are are used to actually a wide range of, of different soil amendments to it. Um, from um, in many cases, gypsum is applied to fields, which different rock types are are filled with different agronomic benefits. So I think the main thing um, to if this is going to work, um, and this kind of goes, or, uh, main thing if this is going to work and it's going to scale. Is you have to provide something that works for the for, works for the farmer. Um, tying into their exact same practices makes it easier for them, um, and making sure that you uh, making sure that you're you're actually you're improving yields um, is 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 absolutely essential. Um, so we have yet to have a field that has relative to the control have a a productivity to crop uh, decrease uh, a yield decrease, um, and uh, I hope to keep that going forever. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Good. I think you mentioned kind of like the worry about potential side effects and kind of controlling for that. Um, someone also asked, you know, this is a really, well, they said this is a really exciting uh, and potentially low cost technique, which is great. Um, and was just wondering, you know, if you can already see some river chemistry changes when you have these large rivers and relatively small test plots, um, how do you think about like, you know, do you have a sense of how that's gonna scale up as you do larger scale deployments um, with regards to the river chemistry? Yeah, um, if, if folks are interested, we actually just, uh, we actually just pub uh, published paper in um, limnology and oceanography on that. Um, at kind of what at scale does this do to the to the river network? And one of the ways you can actually um, maybe to turn that question slightly is one of the questions you can ask is what is the capacity of rivers to carry enhanced weathering products to where it would actually um, you would start having problems with back reactions um, and that. So that's actually one of when we think about what is the capacity of enhanced weathering. One of the things you want to consider is how much you could actually realistically deploy, how much can you realistically dissolve, and the other um, really one of the limiting things you want to have for an area and thinking about globally is how can you actually deal with the products of enhanced weathering from a river from a, a river network perspective. Got it. Okay. Um, cool. So shamelessly then, plug a paper. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I think a lot of people will probably be interested. Um, cool. Um, I think, well, maybe going off of that a little bit, um, someone was asking just a little more detail on like what kind of uh, things you're modeling with the machine learning model that you mentioned, um, you know, kind of what what does that give you uh, that's different from other uh, rock weathering projects and how does that help with uh, the work you're doing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, machine learning is obviously it's it's in some ways it's it's uh, it's become an important part of of basic research in a wide range of fields. So it's, um, and what we're dealing with is for agricultural systems, not surprisingly, thinking about river chemistry, we have massive data sets that are available. So um, our model was in, this, in the field side, our model was developed to always be mechanistically and uh, mechanistically grounded, but have a machine learning component. And when thinking about um, our river networks, that's something where machine learning is essential for that. So um, I think the, the short answer from it is basically if you, what we're trying to do is just, understand how this process works. Um, machine learning is one of several tools that we have to, to um, make sure that we're not over-representing our understanding from a single area, to make sure that um, we can we can also with, with um, 
with confidence assign error to our um to to any estimate that we make something that is very difficult when you're only dealing with something that's grounded in, in chemistry and physics so um it's that's a that's a tough question because um i could ramble about that for a couple hours but um the short is that i think you know i think that as as many people thinking about any quantitative is that machine learning is not something is something that has just become integral to everything that we do right okay definitely um cool and then we just had another question about um some of the things you talked about in terms of clays and other products formed um so what kind of clays and secondary products are generally formed in your rock weathering process and since particles of those sizes might be more susceptible to movement are they also kind of followed as they move through the soil or off of the farm um over time yeah so well we're trying of course one of the main problems with with agriculture right now is is um is is just loss of topsoil. So in all cases, even though in many cases we work with people that are using tilling practices, an essential part of anything you do in agriculture is making sure you minimize erosion. Um, you're, the the correct amount of topsoil loss is zero. <laughs> um, that's never possible. Um, but uh, you know, it's having. But just to 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 start with that, the goal is designing something, and that really includes when you apply when you're spreading, if you're using cover cropping, um, but you're trying to basically minimize the amount of, of loss you have in the system. Um, one of the things I would say is with our technique, we actually can see if we do have significant loss. Um, we're monitoring that was one of the questions that came up in uh, the Q&A that I somewhat stumbled an answer through. Um, but um, so you can monitor it. And I think one of the things that make basically, if you wanna have significant loss of your, of your material, you have a deep tilling and you're doing it in a very wet season. <laughs> if you want to have, if you want to have kind of more responsible topsoil modification, you're um, using as mod as limited of a tilling practice as possible. And without question, you're trying to tie into to cover cropping to ensure that you don't have bare soil exposed. Got it. Um, and with that in mind, actually, this is a way where you can actually regenerate topsoil instead of, of losing it. Right. Okay. Um, we got a quite a few questions about the MRV thing. So I just wanted to go into that. And I think Mary just answered one, which is kind of a general one, which I wanted to start with. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about how does your MRV approach overall kind of is, how is it different from any other rock weathering projects you've seen? Um, and, you know, what kind of uh, advantages do you think your approach might have? Um, yeah, uh, Mary, or I, I can take first one. Mary, please follow up. Um, I think so, you know, in terms of people that are trying to track this right now, there's um, there's really two different ways of thinking that people are trying to think about monitoring waters in farmers fields. And we're trying to think about this from an integrated approach, thinking about the soil from it. Um, so that's that's really the key, the key difference. And I think one of the reasons we've gravitated towards um, towards soils is that anytime you look at a, a water, um, it's it's a snapshot. Right. Um, whereas when you're looking at soil, it's something that is it gives you the look of how much has occurred from the time you put it down to the time that you that you sample. Um, and yeah, I think one of the things we're we're in terms of adv adventures in this, one of the things that I think is a really fun adventure that we're doing right now is basically this. Our, our approach is grounded in mass balance. It can't be wrong, um, but we could have to sample so densely that it's in some areas, it's actually not economically feasible. Yeah. And this is kind of the same problem that people with soil organic carbon are, are focusing on. So it's um, the, a kind of a fun adventure for me. And that is, is as we're getting first, our first um, really intensely sampled data back, both from a research side and, and from a, um, a, a lithos carbon side, we're, we're getting to apply kind of spatial statistic techniques to, to figure out what's going to be kind of the, the price point for that. And that's, that's been, that's been, um, that's really fun. And uh, seeing how variable that is, is something like every, you know, um, every time we get a new data point, it's, uh, it's, it still gives me a reason to, to come to work and be excited. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, we have just a couple more on MRV before I finish up. So uh, one is just um, how, it, well, it's essentially about establishing baseline. So like how much, I guess, pre-sampling do you need to do to establish how much weathering is already happening? Um, and how long down the line do you need to sort of keep measuring things to make sure that there's no reversal occurring? Great. I'll take, do you want me to take the first half of that? I know I need to grab the reversal. Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, I think there's a few different things there. One, um, it's helpful to, it's always helpful, as Noah mentioned, to do more sampling. But again, we do that spatial sort of approach, this uh, like oversample high density, and then prune that to understand what's the minimum that we need to get to in this acceptable error range. And um, we can do that both from like the 
before the basalt was applied, after the basalt was applied, after it's been weathered. We also like to do this against a control field swell, which I think really helps with a baseline, right? That's actually a field that has, you know, similar sort of crops growing, it has some ag lime, it has other things, um, and that really helps us with the baseline. So that's how we start to approach it from the in-field measurement aspect of things. Noah, do you want to take the reversal and reverse? Yeah, I think the, I mean, the, I mean, I, I could have done a better, you could, oh, you could always do a better job of articulating stuff, but I could have done a better job of articulating that reversal, I think is something that we, and it's reversal is maybe not even, it's, it's reversal and thinking about what happens with loss as you have the carbonic acid system re-equilibrating or things that we kind of can just group, group together in that. Um, and I think it's, it's absolutely essential to, to follow that through the entire lifespan of your, of your product of your project, which um, I would say is kind of should be somewhere around a, a thousand, thousand years of permanence. Who knows what permanence is? That has, that's a, a, if you talk to a bunch of different people of what counts as permanent, you get a different answer. Um, but where we like to do it and where we set up our framework to take into account is basically tracking what happens, tracking what happens um, not only on, on a short kind of decade time scale in the field scale, which is a year scale, um, but actually out into to a thousand years. And once you're the difference between 100 years and 1000 years is pretty small, obviously, but um, it's it's still something where it it's uh, I'd like to think that permanence from a, a human time scale perspective will be at least 1000 years. <laughs> yeah, okay. maybe that's being optimistic. <laughs> Call me an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be to be in this uh, this business a little bit. Um, okay, last question um, before I give it back to Toby. Um, uh, the question is basically about crediting. So, how do you think a credit should be generated um, over what time scale? Like, is it at the start, you know, start of the weathering project over time when you actually think the carbon's been captured? Um, and should there be a buffer pool for these types of projects in uh, credit registries? Great question. So our approach is we do this empirically. So we do it after the carbon has been captured. Um, we use Scepter, the software that I talked about, to predict how much is going to be captured. We've got very high accuracy there. We actually generate little graphs of like what we predict and then we plot out what we actually get, you know, a few months later. Um, so that's always exciting. That also helps us with forecasting, finances, all of that. That's really, really good. Um, however, how we actually generate is we do the empirical measurement, that soil-based technique. Um, and we do all of that. We do the LCA. We do the measurement of like the emissions generate all of that. And then at that point, that's when we certify the credits. We know that there's different approaches to this. You can do X ante, you can sort of say like, we think this will be captured over X number of years, but our approach is to do the empirical stuff. And that also I think um, keeps us rigorous. Like we prefer to do that partially because we wanna be constantly generating that data as much as possible. So we can continue to train Scepter and other models that we use and to be as accurate as possible. So that's our approach. We know that other ones exist. Um, for, for approaches that are less empirically based or maybe not, um, not done on like, you know, such a frequent time scale, I think a buffer pool does make a lot of sense. Um, and especially as this is like a permanent carbon removal that a lot of companies are buying because of like the high quality of this credit. Yeah, a buffer pool or some sort of discounting kind of like the one that um, Frontier suggested makes sense. Perfect. Um, thank you guys so much. This has been great. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Toby. If one of you could maybe drop the river monitoring uh, papers, like link or DOI in the chat. I think a couple of people have asked for that. Um, and yeah, yeah thank you so much. I actually, I actually don't even know if it's online yet. Um. Yeah, might still be in review. <laughs> I mean, one thing we can do is like it may not be posted. <laughs> Once it's if you public, guys want to email us, if you guys want to email us at like Noah at Lithos Carbon or Mary at Lithos Carbon, happy to share that because I think it might be still in review. Yeah, no, it's not in review. It's we have the proof. Um, I'm just not sure if it's posted. Online. And and we can also put it out on on Open or Twitter when um when it gets published too. So we'll we'll get it out there. But um, Mary and Noah, thank you so much for being with us today. That was a fantastic presentation and also great um great answers to all of the different and varied questions that you were posed. Um, so. Uh, appreciate your time and, and, you know, congratulations on all your success so far and best of luck with your next steps with with us. Thanks so much. It was great to be with here with you. Um, this seems like, you know, if regular, uh, this is CDR attendees know that open air has some great merch. Um, this seems like a great opportunity to promote one of our items, which is an, I love the salt suite of clothing. We have many different colors, styles, and, uh, we'll put a link in the chat to that. Um, mega, if you have that handy, that would be awesome. Um, and, 
Uh, one other thing, I guess we have, uh, we are working on, we are, we're still working on lobbying for the Federal Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act. So if you're interested in helping us with that, um, join Open Air, and we have a, suite, a set of materials that you can use to reach out to your local congressional representative to ask them to uh, support this important bill, basically to get the federal government to start supporting early stage carbon removal methods um, like uh, enhanced rock weathering with purchases, just like Frontier does. Um, Finally, we have a great session coming up next week. I believe a fellow recent uh, Frontier purchase, Rep Air, which is an electrochemical DAT company um, based in Israel. Um, uh, Amir Shiner, who is the CEO, is going to come tell us about what they're doing, and and uh, and we'll talk about that then. Um, so anyway, thank thank you so much. Uh, excited excited to have you here with us for our fiftieth episode, and thank you again to Mary and Noah for uh, for such a great presentation. Everyone, be well, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Toby.